But he is still facing challenges to complete his goals, some of which were set to be achieved by the end of the year. I love a man with ambition. Don't get me wrong. I think it was a fantastic, uh, valiant idea. Doesn't appear to be working. Uh, last night, his illegal migration bill was delivered a blow in the House of Lords as Labour and Lib Dem members forced through a number of changes to soften the legislation. In fact, I think it was absolutely scandalous. It comes after the European Convention on Human Rights had thwarted the government's Rwanda migration plans. Look, I'm going to ask our, our next guest. Does Rishi need to exit the ECHR, abolish the House of Lords? How's he done in his first six months in charge. And you know what? We might even sneak in a little bit about one Bernard Jenkin, who might find himself maybe in a little bit of hot water with the Met Police over allegations about a lockdown breaking party. Shocking stuff, if indeed true. Who better than the man himself? Jacob Rees-Mogg. Jacob, thank you very much. Um, let's just start with what we were talking about there, really. It's been six months of Rishi Sunak now. He's got his five pledges. I think illegal migration for many people is the most important one. The House of Lords last night ripped the teeth out of it yet again. What do you make of that? Well, I agree with what you're saying, that um, the House of Lords is not acting in its proper constitutional role. It is a revising chamber. Its job is to say this bit of legislation gives too much power to the government. It should be done by an affirmative resolution or a negative resolution, boring, detailed stuff. Mm. What it's doing at the moment is opposing the government's political agenda. That's very different. Um, it's got a majority against the government. And this bill that really comes from the manifesto commitment to get immigration down is now being torn to shreds. And I think they are abusing their position. You posed the question of mm. what should the government do. Well, I'd hate to see the House of Lords abolished. I think yeah. it's really important to have a second chamber and a second chamber that doesn't compete with the House of Commons. The House of Commons is the democratic house. It has the mandate from the British people. That's its strength. That's its right. The House of Lords a revising chamber. The only solution is to appoint more peers. And we've got to carry on appointing until we can get our business through. But it just feels... It must feel to you like everything's a struggle at the minute. You know, you, you try to... You win an election, you try to enact a policy that is actually very popular with the illegal migration bill. It, it is. And if it, it passes the pub test day in, day out, you walk to any pub in the country and it passes it. And then you're up against the lawyers, you're up against the lords, you're up against all, all sorts of people. And it must be incredibly frustrating. Yes, it is. Um, we have ourselves to blame to an extent right. because we brought into law... Uh, the Convention on Human Rights. So when the appeal court judges ruled against the government, they were doing so because of our domestic law, not because of European mm. um, Convention law uh, applied by the European courts. But we should simply override that. We need to legislate to say this is what we will do, mm. and then our courts will follow it. Should we carry on listening to judgments of the European Court of Human Rights? I think we should treat them in the way we did over prisoner voting rights and say thank you so much, very interesting, but actually there's a mandate in Parliament to do something else, that's what we're going to carry on doing. Yeah. Because bear in mind, the European Court of Human Rights does not have direct effect on the law of the land. It's mm. not like the European Court of Justice in the EU. When the EU judges said this is the law, mm. that was it. There was no appeal, there was no Parliament to change it, nothing. With the European Court of Human Rights... It's telling us we ought to change our law. And we can say, thank you so much, we're not going to. And that's the authority and power that we should use. Look, quickly, Bernard Jenkin, your thoughts? Well, it's deeply embarrassing for him, isn't it? Mm. That if you set yourself up uh, as being Caesar's wife, you have to be above suspicion. And he has failed the above suspicion test and will find out whether the investigation proves anything or it's merely... Uh, a, a suspicion that he, he attended. OK, well, time will tell. And again, very, very quickly, I couldn't let you go. I know you're, you're a fantastic cricket lover. Uh, the Aussies, did they cheat? They behaved within the rules. <laughs> and actually, I think the worst thing was the booing in the pavilion. Yes. <clears throat> the MCC is a wonderful bastion of tradition, and I love all that sort of thing, as you yeah, know. Yeah. I'm a complete sucker for <laughs> tradition and doing things properly. Good. Um, you can't then show bad manners, and I thought that was really bad manners, and I care more about that than whether the Australians were highly competitive, pushed the law to the maximum. They're the Australians. What do we expect them to do? I mean, it, it's not a vicarage tea party. No, it's you're not. You're playing the ashes and against it, Australia. And actually, I think it had been a bit too matey up until then as, uh, as well, 